Fiona Hill is a name you might recall. Um, kind of an obscure name, but fairly well known in certain circles. She served as an intelligence analyst under Bush and Obama from 2006 to 2009. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Brookings Institution. She also served as Donald Trump's National Security Council staff from 2017 to 2019 before she kind of turned on him. She testified against him during the first impeachment hearing, uh, but she gave a speech at the Leonard Mary Conference. Leonard Mary was the president of Estonia from 1992 to 2001. And she gave a speech that was a really, really interesting speech. The, the entire speech is available uh, to read, um, but we're going to just read a few segments of it because she's obviously very pro-Ukraine and very anti-Russia, but she was basically there sounding the alarm bell to the foreign policy sort of elites of the world that Ukraine is in fact a proxy war. It's not the kind of proxy war that, you know, uh, guys like Aaron Mate claim it is, which I agree fully with Aaron in, in, in that way, but it's also a proxy war um, in the sense that she is talking about here. She, she does drop a few red pills uh, on the audience here. And so it's not a very long speech. We will link to that uh, in the description of this video as well. I encourage you to read the whole thing. It's not very long, but we're just going to read a few different pieces from it here. Since 1991, the U.S. has seemingly stood alone as the global superpower. But today, after a fraught two-decade period shaped by American-led military interventions and direct engagement in regional wars, the Ukraine war highlights the decline of the United States itself. This Decline is relative economically and militarily, but serious in terms of U.S. moral authority. Unfortunately, just as Osama bin Laden intended, the U.S.'s own reactions and actions have eroded its position since the devastating terrorist attacks of 9-11. Quote, America fatigue and disillusionment with its role as the global hegemon is widespread. This includes in the United States itself a fact that is frequently on display in Congress, news outlets, and think tank debates. For some, the U.S. is a flawed international actor with its own domestic problems. For others, the U.S. is a new form of imperial state that ignores the concern of others and throws its military weight around. What did I say in our last show when we talked about military uh, sort of recruitment numbers sort of sagging? I think there are a lot of reasons for that, but the primary one that I can sort of diagnose as I see it is that there is this fatigue. There is this drain of will post-Cold War and post-9-11, given the squandering of all the goodwill after 9-11 with our various, you know, wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, right? Um, and so she talks about that there, America fatigue, not only around the world, not only is the world getting sick of our shit, but we inside our own borders are becoming sick of our country's shit. And that is creating a sort of existential malaise, a sort of dread, uh, a sort of drain uh, here at home. I'm going to read a second part of it. In the so-called global south, and what I am loosely referring to as the rest of the world, there is no sense of the U.S. as a virtuous state. Perceptions of American hubris and uh, hypocrisy are widespread. Trust in the international system that the U.S. helped invent and has presided over since World War II is long gone. Elites and populations in many of these countries believe that the system was imposed on them at a time of weakness when they were only just securing their independence. Even if elites and populations have generally benefited from Pax Americana, pardon me, uh, they believe the U.S. and its block of countries in the collective West have benefited far more. For them, this war is about protecting the West's benefits and hegemony, not defending Ukraine. Countries in the global South's resistance to the U.S. and European appeals for solidarity on Ukraine are an open rebellion. This is a mutiny against what they see as the collective West dominating the international discourse and foisting its problems on everyone else while brushing aside their priorities on climate change compensation economic development and debt relief the rest feel constantly marginalized in world affairs why in fact are they labeled this is a great quote why in fact are they labeled 
as I am reflecting here, the global South, having previously been called the third world or the developing world, why are they even the rest of the world? They are the world, representing 6.5 billion people. Our terminology reeks of colonialism. Wow. Dropping some red pills on the elite audience there. Now, ultimately, she lands on the side of but we she have to support She just Ukraine. doesn't know math. We have 9 billion right here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Right, right exactly. in the United States. You've never seen such big crowds. You go yeah. from one end of the country to the other. There's so many people. Exactly. Now, what's fascinating about that is she does land ultimately not too far from where the audience of that speech already is, which is, yes, we have to stick it out and support Ukraine, but this is how the world sees it, which, mm -hmm. I mean, we played earlier in the show how the Lincoln Project played that very hawkish ad about Biden and Ukraine and things like that. That's the sort of blue pill version that you still have certain sort of factions of the media, certain factions mm -hmm. of it, more the Democratic Party, but some in the GOP as well, trying to sell people. Um, but what she lays out there, that is absolutely what the conflict is. That's why you have the BRICS alliance taking shape, right? Yep. Um, that's, that's the whole thing. So it is a proxy war by her own admission. The proxy war is the quote unquote rest of the world, wh wh which has two thirds of the world's people, the rest of the world versus the US versus the West versus NATO versus the G7. That's it. She All lays right, it I'm out. Gonna... She, she lays it out right there. That's that's one of your own saying that. That's Miss Resistance Fiona Hill, you know, coming out. She's the one who turned on Trump. She was a big hero on MSNBC. She had her 15, you know, minutes of fame amongst all the libs. She spells it out there about as clearly as you can. You mean she's not going to have a spot on Biden's presidential advisory council? I don't think so. Not talking like that. She don't have the uh, messaging right. All right. So I'm going to tie... I'm going to tie this together with the whole Kissinger thing. And I'm even going to throw in some Joseph Campbell. All right. So anybody who knows Joseph Campbell broke down and showed there's a consistent pattern across the world in its mythologies and his seminal work, the hero with a thousand faces shows how there are certain archetypes in myth that come up again and again. Now the type that she is, and I would argue that Kissinger was, is the scientist, the architect, the one who designs the maze that the Minotaur goes into and doesn't have any particular moral investment in the outcome, right? That's their deal, to make the maze, right? Ooh, this will be interesting. What's going to happen now? A lot of foreign policy people, the best of them, are kind of like that. They're kind of detached, analytical people with no real moral sensibility very much like to really geek out the mentats in dune they were supposed to be pure logic and you use them as advisors but you didn't want to put them in charge and i would argue a guy like kissinger who people still listen to today because from a completely amoral perspective he's very aware of the kinds of things she's describing here he always has been of this real politics, right, right, right. They exactly. called it, of yeah. what's That's going exactly on what and how you interplay. Kissinger's career is what happens when you get a guy like Kissinger working for a guy like Nixon who has no moral vision. You see, a leader can recruit people like that, but they always have to understand the limitations of their vision. They always have to understand that these people are very useful in offering you analysis and information, but they lack a moral center. They lack a moral vision. They see everything as chess. Right. It is for you as a leader to bring a human dimension to the decisions you make, taking that advice into account, but not, ex not basing your policy exclusively on what they would have you do. Kissinger is a guy who had a leader with his own psychopathic tendencies, um, who had his own demons, who had his own lack of moral vision and moral center. Put two guys like that together, you get millions dead, right? It, you could have put Kissinger right. with Kennedy, you wouldn't have had that outcome. He, right. he probably would have been a very good advisor for a leader with some restraint. <laughs> right? Right. But you just, you just let a guy like Kissinger just go based on his cold 
analysis and you wind up getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner as a description for genocidal bombings, right? Um, so look, what she's saying there, yeah, I, I, she has a lot of uh, insight. She has a lot of vision. She has no moral center. Like right. all, all of this is just about, well, how do we play the angles? How do we work the angles? Right, exactly. Right. 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 Uh, but, but her vision... Yeah, I, I I would agree with all of that. The way that she's discussing how these different players are trying to jostle for position, her analysis of where India is in all this, where countries like Japan and Korea are. It, you know, it's it's worth reading this speech if you are interested in uh, what what I would say is a good summation of of where we are geopolitically at this historical moment. Yeah. And what's especially valuable about reading this is, like I said, for any doubters, I mean, most of the people in our audience don't doubt this narrative, but you do get a lot of pushback. If you engage online a lot, you hear the narrative that Biden wants you to hear, that the Lincoln Project types want you to hear, that Lindsey Graham wants you to hear, which is that this is an act of aggression on Russia's part and we owe it to not only Ukraine, but to the world, to put everything on the line to fight back. And here you hear from one of their own who mm -hmm. agrees that we'd have to fight Russia and beat them back and invest in Ukraine, right? She's very, very pro-Ukraine. But you hear her admitting that this is the conflict. She's right. admitting this is the conflict. She is admitting in this speech that, yeah, all that bullshit on MSNBC is just that. It's bullshit. It's nonsense. Right. This is the right. real conflict. Right. Well, and I, I think a lot of them think this way. They just don't say it out loud. Please clap. <laughs>